you know, uh, I could go on for hours, but we'll, we'll talk and we'll move fairly quickly. But we'll talk about people and how they got to the Comstock and what was the method and processes. The, the people themselves, the, uh, the businesses, the entertainment, how did these guys entertain themselves? Uh, photos you've never seen, how we got to where we are today, and probably some oddball stuff about, about Virginia City and the Comstock. <coughs> This will be comprised, as it says, about an hour of your life that you're going to never get back. So I hope that we have some material that you'll find interesting, and I'll certainly entertain any questions at particular any point in time. So don't be afraid to, to interrupt me with a question uh, other than where's the bathroom, and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll go off and answer that particular question if we need to. If you could punch the button for me, please. We'll try. All right. Oh, last time I used it, it was that button. <laughs> it was the uh, regular uh, left click button. There we go. All right, Bob already introduced me pretty much, so it just kind of tells you where. Where, uh, who I am and what I'm about. Uh, I lived in D.C. when my parents moved up there in 59 uh, when Bonanza came on TV and they opened up several, a couple of businesses up there. Uh, I've been the volunteer chief up there for 20 years. I'm also the Story County Emergency Management Director and have been for about the last five years. I sit on the board of the Comstock Historic District, uh, which I just got snookered into being the vice chair of. Uh, and I'm the Virginia City Commission and Tourism Authority, the Comstock Fireman's Museum Secretary, I own the Bar Point Bookstore. I have a graphics and sign company. Fortunately, as you can tell, the graphics and sign company has absolutely nothing to do with video stuff. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a lover of Comstock history. I don't profess to be an expert on any of this material. I do have a love for it, and I do have a good collection, and I have a pretty good knowledge of, of most of the, of, of the material. Uh, and I'm a collector of all things Virginia City. So if you have Comstock artifacts or something, don't leave them laying about in my presence. Uh, next slide, please. And the next one. And a quick word from our sponsor. Now, if you need a scam watch, They got here looking like this. This is a this is a taken from a glass plate they do. 
that um, uh, shows some miners roughly in the 1860s. And this is how they came. Four, three, four, five guys uh, walking along with their mule donkey that uh, uh, had their material on it, and they arrived in this, in, in, over the mountains and however they needed to. This is another one, glass plate negative. And, and this, these almost look like set up slide situation. But these are real guys. These are the 1860s pictures. And, uh, of course, some of them are in pretty rough condition. And I, I put a lot of them uh, through Photoshop and, and kicked them up and, and, and brought them into to, uh, some better position. But you see, just like you might see in a movie, you got, you got your gold pen, you got all your materials, your shovel, your pick, uh, and, and this trusted donkey. It was just he and his donkey, and that's how they, they arrived, looking just like that. Next. <clears throat> One of the primary ways that they came up through the area is they came up through the Silver City. Silver City lies right down in here. This is what's called Devil's Gate, and this is a toll house. Virtually every road going to Virginia City was a toll road, or going out of Virginia City was a toll road. And there were about five of them. There, were, there was a toll road, there was a Virginia City uh, 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 Truckee River toll road, which actually went north and went down, dropped down to what is now the Lockwood area or Interstate 80, if you think of Interstate 80, east of Sparks, about four miles east of Sparks. <clears throat> this came up, this is what comes up uh, Highway 50, uh, down, way down below, Dayton and Beef over the hot top of this hill here, and then uh, came up here and they paid a toll. The toll rates were, were something in the neighborhood, depending upon which road you came up, were in the neighborhood of about five cents a ton of material, or five cents for a walker, or a rider, various different price factors that they had. And it was, it was not an easy trek for them. It was hard, hard, hard work. These people, uh, in the summertime, uh, they had nothing, they had no air conditioning, keep in mind. In the wintertime, you, had, you did not have um, uh, down coats, you didn't have, you had maybe a leather jacket, and, and, and it just, it, if, you, if you stop and think about this, and you think about how cold it's been out here the last couple of days, and you think, they had no insulated boots, they had just leather boots, and think about the last time that you wore just plain old leather shoes when it was just 10 degrees outside, and how cold your toes got, and, and how difficult of a situation it, it must have been. This guy's got a freight wagon, and he's, and he's getting rid of this. He, the toll house is over here, right, right here. And uh, this is actually an ore chute uh, shoot where he would be picking up ore from a mill that, that is just the way <coughs> back up on the side of the hill. Next chart. This is an overview look, and this is actually a later picture. But this is Six Mile Canyon, Sugarloaf, Dayton Valley out here. And this is the Six Mile route that came up through Virginia City. This was a toll road also. Next. Here it looks from down in the Six Mile Canyon up into Virginia City. This is roughly about an 1868 uh, photograph, somewhere along in there, uh, 1870s photograph. This is Union Street, in other words, so right here, uh, for the guys here who would recognize this mostly, would be the Bucket of Blood, uh, the saloon. Um, when your wife was shopping, you were probably in there. The uh, uh, St. Mary's Church up here. This is prior to the fire, so you, so you don't see the same outline as you did before. But in front of this was actually a Methodist church, and here's the Episcopal church. Uh, so this is a truck fire. <coughs> there was a lot of these guys as they came into the area, and at this point in time, you probably got um, eight to 10,000 people in the community in the greater area. They had to feed them somehow. They fed them by bringing uh, uh, beef and so forth from the Dayton Valley, from the Washoe Valley, from the Truckee Meadows, uh, and from Carson Valley is, is where their beef primarily came from. Uh, a lot of their veggies as well. But they had truck gardens in Virginia City as well, which is what this is. Uh, this is a truck garden, and this is another one. There were two dairies in Virginia City. One of the dairies, my house is actually built on the property where uh, one of the dairies was located. And, uh, uh, and it's right next to where the old Chinatown was. And when we built it, we found a lot of artifacts there in, in that immediate area. Next slide. Did you also, when you said dairy, did they also have creamery there? Or they probably 
process? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would say yes, because, and the reason I say that is because ice cream was a very popular thing up there. In fact, they, and I'll show you a picture later on where they were have, actually having an ice cream social um, and, as, as one of the entertainment forms. So, yes, they had ice. Ice was, uh, was actually manu not manufactured, but manufactured by nature, of course, but they had, they had uh, reservoirs, several different reservoirs that, uh, that they would, in the wintertime, they would cut the ice from the reservoirs and then they would store it in what they called the ice house. And what it was, was you got all this ice, how do you keep this cold? Well, what's the, what, what is another major thing that had to have, they had to have on the Comstock in order to produce anything in terms of mining, milling, or whatever? <coughs> they had to have wood. What, from wood, what do you get? Sawdust. And it's a sawdust is, is the item that they packed around the ice, and that's what kept the ice through the summertime. So they had all kinds of that. The reason that I asked that question is my grandmother um, was uh, the daughter of the person who had that cream. Oh, is that right? What, which cream are you reading? I don't remember what the name of it was, but my grandfather lived in Vermont, Texas now. Mm -hmm. He used to take his milk to pre range for things. It was my fault. And I turned off the switch, turned off oh my lights, and I turned off the I mean, Do you have any photographs of that night? Oh, yeah. No, I you know I may have a photograph. I'll have to look and see. I may have a photograph. It's back on. Is it? It's just it's warming up now. We lose a breaker or anything? Oh. <laughs> Am I done? <laughs> Are we going to the J and T now? <laughs> Precincts, 
but uh, at that time they referred to as Ward. There was the there was the first Ward school, which was this north end. The second ward, which was kind of this central portion of town. Uh, the third ward was down in here, and the fourth ward was up here on the, on the divide in this area up in here. Consequently, the fourth ward school, which is still there, and you, you, you may have been in there or seen pictures of the fourth ward school. The second ward school was, a, was probably even more ornate than the, first ward, the uh, fourth ward school. Uh, I have the only picture that I've ever seen and that I would have is a picture that shows maybe an eighth of that second ward schoolhouse building. And it was quite a quite a, a fantastic structure, very, very pretty. People, some, a lot of people see that picture and they go and they see this up in the little corner, and I think it's in here later that I'll point it out to you. But a lot of people for some reason I think it was a brothel and they keep mentioning it and oh it's a so and so brothel. But uh, it was a school, actually. And the reason they say that is because in later maps, it says it was female boarding. And it was female boarding. It was, it was a boarding house um, at, at a point in time in the 1890s. Next slide. Okay. What do you have to have in every one? You've got to have a post office. This is one of the first post offices. Uh, and this is some of the local people hanging around the post office like they still do today, right? Uh, this uh, this post office was on C Street, the main street in town, and it was it was uh, located more to the north end of town than anything. Uh, but the post office with the post office there was moved, and this is the first one. The second one was moved a little further down the street, and the third one is where the one is now currently is uh, is actually located in the in more up towards the center of town. And the post office, like in any community, is used as a um, as a guidepost, in other words, well, go down the street until you see the post office, and then there's two buildings south of there. You know, everybody does that. Next slide. This is Gold Hill. And this is Gold Hill looking up toward Virginia City, it's up over the top of this hill. This is what's called the Divide. And originally, it was called Middletown. It was called Middletown because it's in the between Virginia City and Gold Hill. Now, at the time this was taken, Gold Hill was actually a city of its own. It was an incorporated city at that time. It had its own uh, 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 alderman for the community. It had its own police department. It had its own uh, uh, government, if you will, its own city makeup government. And, and Virginia City had its own makeup at that time. It was actually two separate communities. Today, they're just kind of all rolled into one. This is the Virginia and Truckee Railroad trestle. So this, that tells us this photograph is, was, is after 1869. This photograph is actually about 1872, 1873, somewhere along in there. And we can date that by the fact that there are certain buildings in certain locations here. This being one of the original old mines up there, the, uh, um, uh, in one, in, in over here, you well, it's tough to see them, I think, it just escaped me the, uh, which one that is. You may have heard the term Homestead, Fort Homestead. This was Fort Homestead. It was never a military fort, but it was called that. It was more of a park than anything. Uh, at the time they called it Fort Homestead, they were under the belief, all the residents of Virginia City and Gold Hill were under the belief they were going to be attacked by Indians. And so they established this fort. Now, if you remember the picture earlier of, of, of Devil's Gate in the, in the toll gate, right above that would have been on, the, on that, that side of the gate, on the top of that rock outcropping, there was another little, if you want to call it a fort, it was more like a, they had piled up rocks around there, and it was to protect the gate for when the Indians would come in to uh, prevent them from being able to get up to, to uh, Virginia City. They also had that with the thought in mind that if, if the Confederates ever got up to that point, they'd have a, a way to defend the, the, the Devil's Gate there. Uh, you can see that there was a tremendous amount of people living in Gold Hill at that time. It later, the vast majority of this later burned. Gold Hill had a major fire, just much like Virginia City did in 1875. So it was, uh, uh, it was a major event. This down here is, is what is the crown point uh, mill and, and workings down here. Uh, the, uh, there's a number of mines along here. There's a, there, the, just down below us here is the Justice, and then there's the Kentucky, and the, uh, uh, a number of other mines and mills. 
This was a major community all of its own, with, with everything from its newspaper to its post office, banks, and, and you name it, they, they were there. It's like this. Here again, just a real rough picture. This is that same slide, but to show you about how Six Mile Canyon is, and point out the fact that if you go right down in here, just right in that area there, was, a, was another little community called Flowery. And Flowery was actually a mining district, but there were about 500 people that lived down here in the canyon. And if you get down behind Sugarloaf here, or actually it's in front of Sugarloaf, excuse me, and you come back up here, that's what they call Seven Mile Canyon. How many, anybody ever been up into Seven Mile Canyon? Okay, did you ever wonder why it's called Seven Mile Canyon when it's like about a mile long? Yeah. Did you? Well, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the answer. Six Mile Canyon goes from the, from the Dayton Valley and comes all the way up to Virginia City, and that's six miles. When they were, remember we talked about the roots coming into Virginia City? Well, the, route, the routes or the roots, depending on what kind of country, the country you're from. Uh, as, as, as you came into Virginia City from the, if you visualize the north end from Geiger Gray, it drops down into that Seven Mile Canyon area. That was another toll road that came in. Well, originally, what that, that road, uh, where if you think of the paved road today, the Seven Mile Canyon Road actually went all the way out to what's called Five Mile Flat, which is that flat dip area between north of Virginia City and, and going to drop down Geiger Grade into Reno. Well, if you, if you, if you uh, there's two things that you can do. If you judge the distance from Five Mile Flat down into Seven Mile, which was a major route because they come in Seven Mile from down here and up here to Virginia City. There was no northern route out of Virginia City in those early days. That would be seven miles. The other way, it's also seven miles if you start from here and come up to, to the mouth of Seven Mile and go out to where it ends today, it's another seven miles also. So that's where your seven miles come from. It's, and we get a lot of questions. Um, I've got this, this like five pages of sh uh, questions that people ask us in the bookstore. Some of the world's dumbest questions. And, and I have some really good, some really favorite ones that people ask us all the time. Uh, they, they'll ask us, what does the B stand for on the side of the hill? Well, you know, you got a B on the side of the hill here. Cars and stuff. They ask us, so what's the B stand for? So we'll tell them, we'll tell them, well, oh, it, that's really not a B, it's an arrow, and it points to the goal. <laughs> they like that more, or the better one, and it, 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 it always garners just a blank stare, is we'll tell them, oh, the VO it stands for Reno. <laughs> and they'll look at you, and pretty soon they'll go, oh, okay. <laughs> it's hard to keep a straight face. There's a bunch of other ones, I mean, it goes on and on. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the other one is, people will come in the store and they'll say, what this building used to be? It's always been a building. <laughs> Have you lived here all your life? Not yet. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm talking, all right? Next slide, please. <laughs> this photograph is, uh, was taken in the 1880s, and this is this is that area that we called Middletown at that time. This is the Fulton Foundry which was a foundry, uh, they manufactured all of their, all the water, the fire hydrants that you found in, in, in Virginia City and Lake Tahoe. Uh, Virginia City and Gold Hill, uh, where Lake Tahoe came from. Um, and and uh, they manufactured, you know, the steel um, uh, poles that you see on the fronts of the buildings and, and porch posts and so forth. If you look down at the very bottom of them, you'll see two or three different uh, titles. You'll see Union Iron Works, San Francisco, some of them were manufactured there. Or you'll see Gold Hill Foundry, or you'll see Fulton Foundry. And, and uh, that's, that's right there where they were manufactured, Fulton Foundry. Now this photograph, this is the Julia, the Julia Mine. Uh, and this is the Virginia Truckee Railroad coming into town on virtually the same track route as it does today. And uh, we go on up to its, uh, to its buildings there. Um, this is the Collar Mine. And uh, of course, the Collar Mine still exists as a tourist mine today. The, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, structure, uh, there's, you can't really 
see it very well, but right back up in here uh, is a uh, is a reservoir. Actually, it's right over in here. There's a reservoir. And I don't remember if I have a picture of that in here or not. There's 90 of these pictures, and I hope we can get through them really quick. Uh, <laughs> this, this, I can say, is this is Gold Hill, right over the side of this hill here. This is Gold Hill. Bullion Ravine, and this is Mount Davidson right here, going on the, where the V for Reno is. And uh, next slide, please. This is what's called an arrastra. This is the earliest process by which they began processing the gold and silver, primarily the gold ore that they had. This is the Gould and Curry Mill. This is in the mouth of Seven Mile Canyon. You go down the six and it's right there at the mouth of Seven Mile Canyon. And as you can see, what they did is they put the ore, the old ore, would go in these rounds. This is actually a Mexican process that was uh, devised by the Mexicans and, and they, they uh, showed them how to do this when they came into the area. You put all your ore here and you run these mules over it, over it, over it, over it until it crushes it down or breaks it, breaks it down just from the, from the weight of the mules walking on it and so forth. And uh, then the ore was processed up here in the mill uh, as, as it was crushed and, and, and broken down. Later on, the process they used was, was what's called uh, stamps. And you, you you may or may not have seen stamps, but what's and I don't have a picture of it. Stamps are are a, just a series of, of pipes that are about four to six inches in uh, diameter. They're just steel rods, or not steel, but iron rods, cast rods, and they're on a cam. And they they were in groups of usually groups of twos, and then the com more common was anywhere from from four four stamps up to eight stamps, or sometimes 16 stamps in the bigger mills. And they were on a cam, so that as the cam turned, by some process, either steam, which was the common process, that would develop steam and, and turn these cams, then these steel rods would just bounce up and down as the ore passed through underneath them and crushed the ore. Next slide. This is in downtown Virginia City. Currently today, uh, roughly right in this process where this sits today is where the Ramada Hotel is now. The new Ramada, which is two, just two years old. This is the Over Ore Works. Just to the north of this was the Over Hoisting Works where the shaft went down in the, in the ground. There was two, basically two kinds of shafts that went down into Virginia City. There was uh, the, what's called a single shaft and a double shaft, and they were generally 10 by 10 for a single shaft or 10 by 20 for a double shaft. And, and, and the shaft, of course, had a cage that went down, and that's how the miners went down or came back up uh, in, in, in those, kind of, in those uh, cages. Dangerous, super dangerous. They weren't closed in. Um, there was no OSHA then, so, you know, there were a lot of, lot of uh, injuries, a lot of deaths, and very common. Uh, if you put your hand out a little bit, you can, if your hand's caught between the, 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 the wall of the shaft and the, and the cage, rip off arms. Um, people had heads ripped off, um, arms, legs, and, and it was pretty gruesome, pretty gruesome event. Some, uh, there were some instances where, where, the, um, where the cables broke, and the, and the, the uh, uh, cages would drop to the bottom. And how deep are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, upwards to 2,500, 3,000 feet below the surface. Now, what's the, what's the altitude of Virginia City on C Street? Anybody know? 6,200 feet. What's that the same as? Oh, wow. Lake Tahoe, exactly. So if you think about the fact that it drops down from the surface there, 3,000 feet below the surface. What's the deepest point in Lake Tahoe? 1,600 feet. About 1,700 feet. So it's dropping down to 6,000 or 3,200 and some odd feet below the level of the surface. So it's twice as deep as Lake Tahoe, these shafts, these tunnels and mines that went down into the ground. Um, so um, you're halfway to sea level. That's a long, long ways down. Next slide. This is the Utah. This is up in Seven Mile Canyon. Uh, this was the, the, the Utah uh, mine. And uh, usually you can, you can tell if it's a mine versus a mill because the mine is going to have a, a singular tall building that will be one, in this case, it's roughly three stories plus. 
uh, and, and you'll really have some large group on, on a smaller footprint building because that's where the um, head frame was located. And uh, now you go around and you see a head frame that is exposed. In 1911, the federal government said these kinds of uh, covered, excuse me, covered structures, covered head frame structures, they had to be daylighted. They could not have covered structures over those uh, because of fire hazards uh, and, and other kinds of hazards. They all had to be daylighted. So that's why you don't see the, the head frames enclosed in structures uh, are remaining. There's a whole lot of reasons why there's nothing up there. And we'll talk about those briefly as we move on further on down. Yes, sir. The head frame where the hoisting works is? Correct. I'm sorry. I should have explained that. The question was, is the head frame where the hoisting works? Well, yes. The head frame being that, that A-shaped frame where you see a big, you'll see a big spool on the top for the cable to go in and to go down. That's, that's, what was, that's what was inside this structure, inside that building. Did they remove those to get rid of the vapors? Uh, yeah, there was a number. There was the, the vapor problem, the uh, uh, vapors of, of, of all sorts of different things. Uh, potential for fire, because if, if these things caught, if the structure caught fire, which is not unusual, if there's caught fire, the potential for it to catch fire to the head frame and then move down into the shaft was significant. So that's why the government said they all had to be uh, opened up. This is the Con Virginia smelter, actually, in the mill. And uh, it was all combined into one thing. This one here uh, had a head frame inside, and then you had uh, processing on the outside. Now, if you notice here, uh, uh, there apparently must have been something going on here. They, they would stage these photographs, very often staged. You can see the wood pile up here. Now, where did this wood come from? Well, we all know it came from a number of places, primarily around various aspects of Lake Tahoe, from Lake Valley to, to Incline. And most of it would be, would be either towed by, by uh, one of the biggest tow boats, was the Meteor at Lake Tahoe. They would tow it over to Glenbrook, and that's where their primary mills were. And then they had, from Glenbrook, they had a little small uh, narrow gauge railroad that would pull it up the incline up to the summit, or, and then it would go down by flume, or there was another flume process that went from uh, Spooner Lake and then went down through Clear Creek to the bottom. Another flume, uh, major flume, was the one right there, essentially where uh, 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 Kingsbury is, was another major flume line. That's what Kingsbury started out as, as a flume line. Uh, and, then, and then you've got, uh, well, let's see over there, I guess this would be, this represents Joe Peak, does it? No, no it's over there. Yeah. That's over there. Yeah. Uh, but that's Clear Creek. Uh, and the thing that's interesting, if you look at those lines, you'll see that the end of those, all those flume lines, whether it be Kingsbury, Clear Creek, Kings Canyon, Ash Canyon, um, uh, over Lakeview. Um, Frank Town, there was one above, that came down from Frank Town, and another one that was Huffaker, which is kind of, or Steam, there was Steamboat, and then there was Huffaker. Uh, it came out of Hunter Lake. And uh, they all end right where the railroad <coughs> right? And so, so they just tracked perfectly, because that's where the railroad took it out. Next one. This, uh, uh, this is an amazing picture, because it shows two identically built structures. Actually, it's a uh, stereo slide. Um, but it, it's, uh, this is an original stereo slide as well. And uh, uh, it's kind of interesting to know this is one of the mill buildings in Gold Hill. Uh, or not mill buildings, but mine, mine structures in Gold Hill. If you see this uh, trestle area here, uh, this is, um, uh, there was a mine that was right back up here. And as, this, as the overburden would come out on the cars, they would come out of the park and just dump it down here. Well now, this is all, was built up and has since been graded away. It's right on the divide, uh, going up into uh, where, guy, where Grinders Bend is. And a lot of people call that Grinders Bend, and that, that's not correct, it's Grinder, G-R-E-I-N-E-R. -E Grinders Bend, the switchback just before you go up into Virginia City. Uh, how many people here have never been to Virginia City? Oh, thank you. 
That's very helpful. Um, if if, uh, uh, if, if, if uh, you remember the, the switchback, uh, William Griner, he was a, he was a uh, doctor, and uh, he actually was one of the early franchise people to get a, um, a toll road up into that area. The other one being Geiger, uh, William Geiger, and Geiger was what actually got the very first franchise to build the road, that was 1861, and he built Geiger Great, and the legislature gave him a franchise. And that's, uh, that was built and then it was improved in 1936 uh, and widened and, and, and paid in 1936 to uh, come up to Virginia City. Next slide. This is, uh, this is the uh, uh, Con Virginia uh, pan mill and uh, hoisting works. And um, uh, here's the hoisting works and here's the pan mill. And, and uh, back here you can see St. Mary's right here in St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And if you look closely, if you notice here, right here, St. Mary's steeple is not there. Now why is that? What happened in October of 1875? The fire. The fire. Do, you, I, do any of you remember the story of that St. Mary's was potentially going to burn it would be uh, it would be a potential uh, ability for it to pass the fire further into the community, and so who was it that said if if you'll let me uh, explode the, the roof off of St. Mary's, we'll save the walls, and I'll pay to rebuild the uh, St. Mary's uh, structure, and uh, everything will be fine and wonderful again. Who was that? Was it John. Okay. Uh, John Mack. Exactly. John Mack. He was a very uh, he was a very philanthropic person, and he was a very hardcore Irish um, uh, Catholic. In this, in St. Mary's is Irish Catholic uh, Church, um, uh, and so this is this photograph was taken not too long after the fire, uh, probably oh several years after the fire, three, four, five years after the fire, around eight, around nineteen eighty or nineteen. 1880, 81, and it still hasn't been quite completed. And you can see if you start studying the picture right here, you, again, you've got scaffolding actually on the back side of the picture. And there's another picture I have that, that should have been taken further down the canyon, and you can see the scaffolding even, even better yet. Uh, but that fire destroyed approximately 60% oh, of the community. Uh, next slide. This again is down in Gold Hill. This is the Crown Point Trestle. Remember the other picture we had was taken from up here, looking back down this way. And this is after this picture, this, this mill was, uh, was built um, um, uh, specifically to process ore uh, from the various mines. Now there's a, there's, there's a couple of interesting stories of, about the mills and mines, and it, I'm, I'm kind of digressing a little bit here, but if you go back to the original, the early history, the beginning as early as 1861, and remember they find gold 1859, 1860, and in 1861, it's really beginning to develop as a corporate environment. It, uh, gold Hill, or my, uh, the Comstock was not an every man for themselves uh, panning for gold. First off, there was no water to speak. So it developed as an underground corporate environment, and it was primarily financed by one man. Anybody know who that was? William Ralston. William Ralston was one of the founders of the gold of the Bank of California. And, and by, uh, by roughly 1867, 68, he totally controlled the uh, 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 virtually 95% of all the wealth on the Comstock. He owned the mines and the mills. And, and, and if you think Enron was a manipulation of stock and so forth, <laughs> Enron had nothing on Mr. Ralston. Now, what he did is, is he, would, he would buy and sell his own stock, and he would sell it to people at high, and then, and then, and then uh, he would buy it back in the low time. And the way he would manipulate that was, there was two things he would do. One, uh, if, a, if a guy would open up a mill, he would prevent the ore from his mines to be processed by that mill, <laughs> thereby essentially running him out of business, and then he would buy up that mill, so he would control it. The other thing he would do is when in one of his mines, 
they would find a, a bonanza of ore, a big pocket of ore, he would keep those miners down in the mine so that they couldn't come out and say, hey, we just we found a great big uh, pocket of ore, and we're all going to make a lot of money. And, and so if you did that, the people would start buying up the stock and so forth, and he didn't want that to happen. He, before, the, before he let them know there was a big bonanza, he, he wanted to be able to buy up as much stock as he possibly could so that he could sell it later at a big profit. 1868, along comes two guys. Who might those be? Mackey and Club. Fair. Mackey and Fair. Mackey and Fair were kind of partners in the mother load in California. They come over and, and Fair was, was, was pretty good knowledgeable um, uh, and a, a mining engineer <coughs> kind of guy. He was a mineralogist and, and Mackey was, was kind of the brains kind of guy. And uh, uh, they began noticing in the paper that uh, the, the, the Hale and Norcross mine in particular would, uh, 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 when, they, when they had to find a, a, a bonanza of ore down there, he would, Ralston would keep the miners down there and they noticed in the paper and say there was a shipment of, of, of uh, blankets or there was extra food that went down to these guys down in the mine. And they got curious and got, so they started developing a plan to uh, begin to take over ownership of the Hale and Norcross, or to take up control of the Hale and Norcross. And, and the process by which they did that was they, they, they enlisted assistance. They knew they were going to have to do this by manipulating stock, duh. And uh, they were going to have to have someone on the inside in the San Francisco stock mining stock exchange. The two guys they incorporated into their little group to do this was Flood and O'Brien. Flood and O'Brien had been partners in a, in a, a pub, a saloon in San Francisco, and they'd sold that business, and they'd made a fair amount of money, and they went into the, to the uh, stock brokerage concept. Well, it wasn't long before the four of them uh, bought up enough stock to take control of the Hale and Norcross. About that same time, when they, did, when they uh, got control of the Hale and Norcross, what happened was, <coughs> The old, uh, uh, the old management, which was William Sharon, who was a ruthless um, uh, and, and unscrupulous to some many degrees businessman, uh, had levied an $80,000 uh, levy against the stockholders to continue doing business, much of which he pocketed. And, and uh, uh, about the same time that these, that Matthew Fair, Flood, and O'Brien take this over, within about a month, they all of a sudden just happened to find a, a bonanza of ore. They happened to find it, I guess it was some kind of luck there to some degree, but the other reason is because of Fair's ability to analyze the quality of this particular mine uh, when they began this, over, this uh, takeover process. When they did that, um, they, uh, they, the, uh, they, they re uh, negated or or turned around that $80,000 levy against the stockholders and paid it back to the stockholders. And then within about six months' time, they had paid another dividend of over $500,000 to the stockholders. So they were like, one, they had made a lot of money, and two, they were like the saviors. This is now 1869, 1870. So Matthew Fair, Flood, and O'Brien now begin buying up everything else. And by 1875, they essentially put the Bank of California out of business, in, in Virginia City anyway. The Bank of California, William Sharon, pull out, <clears throat> they go back to San Francisco and do their business in California, and John Mackey and his, and, and his uh, Silver Kings or Bonanza crew, or however you want to term them, open up the Nevada Bank of San Francisco in 1875. Uh, it just happens that, that that particular bank was in the building that I own in Virginia City. Uh, there's, there's really not much there that tells you that, except if you go down in the basement, the, the vault is still there. The door's gone, but the vault, vault is there. And uh, I just use it for storing stuff in. And, uh, but uh, that bank then progressed and continued to flourish until 1890, when the bank of, uh, Nevada Bank of San Francisco essentially goes out of business because Mackey sells it and just shuts it down, makes his money and moves on. 
and the Bank of California comes back into the community and is there until uh, the late 1920s, and then it goes away slightly. This is the, this is the Savage Hale Norcross uh, combination. This was a total boondoggle. This is uh, the remains of this is is on the uh, side of the hill. Uh, Virginia City. If we're, if we're standing here by this. Virginia City is off over here. So if you're in town over there and you're looking over here towards the side of the hill, uh, this is you'll see the remains on the side of the hill. And you'll see the the uh, uh, foundational material of it is all. There's no structure over there at all. But you can drive right over right over to where that is. <clears throat> they summed that, that is actually, was the deepest, 3,260 feet below the surface, and really basically found nothing, unfortunately. That was kind of a boondoggle one. The Hales, the Savage, Hale, Norcross, and Collar combination. Next slide. Uh, here, here's from down below in, in kind of Six Mile Canyon looking up uh, towards Virginia City, roughly 1880. Uh, this is uh, the Nevada mill, uh, is a milling process. Look at this cordwood stacked up here. There was uh, over, a, over a, um, a five year period of time, there was something like two million cords of wood burned, just used for generating steam in Virginia City. There was uh, three, four times as much as that that was actually put down in the mines in order to use for. Uh, uh, Square set timbering to hold hold the the, uh, the dirt back. This is uh, what, what now is St. Mary's Art Center. Uh, was a hospital. Was um, uh, was a county hospital at a later time. But this was the the daughters of charity. Uh, Catholic nuns uh, were, were the ones that ran that hospital. Uh, this up here is the Oper. We you saw it from another angle. And up uh, here is the uh, uh, International Hotel, the Frederick House Hotel, which rivaled the International, but you never hear anything about the Frederick House. And uh, uh, it was always considered a lesser to the, to the International Hotel, but it was every bit as big as the International. Um, the, uh, if, if this is our street. Right over here now, okay, right here, is, is the Story County High School and uh, football field, right here. Or eight man football. First time we've probably read that. First time we've had that since 1944, I think it was. <clears throat> and um, uh, if you go from here and you go straight up here, you go straight up uh, Union Street. Union Street goes right past there, the, and then to C Street, and the bucket of blood again right there. Uh, next slide. This is uh, the, the uh, CNC, the Con Virginia, and the Combinator. Con Virginia, Consolidated Virginia, and California. Two mines went together, and uh, uh, they consolidated their work to uh, to produce uh, uh, the ore from, from the two of them. Uh, they're very deep. Start out as a shaft, and it goes back off there. This is the Nevada uh, brewery, and uh, this burned in 1983. I believe it was, uh, and. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it was at that time, it was what we call the Yogi's House. There was a group of um, yogis, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, so it's sort of like the, what was the, what's the ones that were in the hospital, the Hare Krishnas? Kind of like Hare Krishna kind of guys. And uh, they had a, a retreat up here. And, and there was, they, they didn't really understand electricity really well, I guess. They had a million things plugged into one thing, and, uh, and it had been in burn in 1983. Uh, this area here is all is all built up now. There's all homes all along in here. Uh, this is all, of course, all gone. This photograph is uh, probably 1886, 85, 86. Um, Sun uh, uh, or Mount Davidson, right here. Next slide. This is the California Pan Mill uh, down the Six Mile Canyon, looking up. And um, another one of these questions. I, I showed this slide to somebody and they go, how oh, come there's no bee up there? <laughs> uh, when, when you propose that bee would be a 
have been there. You know, there's a bunch of stories about how these letters got on these mountains and so forth. You know, and there's several several different stories as, as to it, and uh, I won't go into those. But um, uh, you know, I, it's like I had one of my sons convinced one time that you know the little labels on on bananas that says. Um, um, the Chiquita, yeah, yeah, the, um, the Chiquita bananas. I, I had it convinced that those grew on there. They had this special <laughs> <laughs> Still today, he thinks, you know, that's amazing how they grow those. Yeah. The guy's 40 years old and still thinks they're growing on those bananas. Um, next slide, please. This, at, they, they, uh, they didn't have enough mills in Virginia City to process all of the ore. So they had to, they had to establish mills in other locations. Now, this is Carson City, just over the top of the hill. Carson City's landfill would be right back up in here now. And, and this, is the, the, this is the Merrimack and the Brunswick mills. Uh, and um, uh, the, there were actually 17 mills all along this route. There, the Merrimack, the Brunswick, the the, um, uh, the Eureka, the, I can't even remember them all off my head. The, and, and they were big mills, major mills. They were, that was the primary reason that they built the Virginia Truckee Railway was to get the ore from the Comstock down to these mills. And they processed hordes and hordes of, of, of this. And this was all, this was all uh, Quicksilver, all mercury processing. And, I, you know, as a kid, we used to go out there, we used to fish in the river all the time. We used to fish home and eat it. And, you know, there was a, what was it, a few years ago, there was this big stink about this, the Carson River being a, uh, a super fun, uh, uh, toxic river cleanup thing. I seem to be fine at this point. <laughs> <laughs> they did it. They, yeah, yeah, I had a, a little flavor. You know, it was like pre-salted fish. Uh, and and uh, they, I guess they did some testing, as I recall, and they determined that they could find no instances of deaths or injuries or sicknesses as a result of the fish eaten out of the, of the river. Um, and they finally realized that that quicksilver, that mercury, you know, just sinks down into the mud and so forth and so forth that it really doesn't have any effect on anything. The other thing, the other thing is cyanide, which is interesting, is cyanide, uh, which, is, which was later used as a process uh, for milling ores. Cyanide actually uh, lit the leeches out of the ground. It, it gets in the ground, leeches out of the ground in 12 years uh, at any one given point. So cyanide is not a particular problem. They, 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 they'll tell you, you know, don't, don't go playing in the sand piles down by the mills because it would have cyanide or other chemicals in it. And I suppose that's true, but here again, I've never seen any problem in Virginia City, no kid having a problem, or my kids never had any problem. I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> get a check. Um, so they, you know, they both became firemen, so maybe that's the problem. Uh, they, so, uh, they, still they, they, mining? I'm sorry? Are they still doing any mining up there? Actually, yes, they are. There, uh, there's, uh, there's two mining operations. One's fairly good sized. And the other one is a little small mom and pop thing, and it's actually below Silver City just before you get to Highway 50. The major one is called Plum Mining. And if, you, if, if you're familiar with coming up through, Gold, through Silver City up through Gold Hill, on your left side as you come up, there's a big pit. And re, that pit has been reopened, and they're really re, uh, taking ore out of there again. Um, there's two things. Very good question. What happened to these shafts, and how many? How many? It, it, uh, probably, probably 150, 200, uh, depending on different different depth factors, anywhere from 15 or 20 feet to 3,260 feet. Uh, those, the, the, the really deep shafts, those, there's two things that happened to them. One, well, primarily what they did in, in for the deeper ones that were more up in close into town, around in the 1920s, they began trying to they figure out how are we going to fill these in. So what they would do is they'd run old derelict car bodies into them. Remember, they're only 10 foot by 10 foot, these single shafts. And they'd bend these car bodies into them, and they'd get jumped in there and, and stuck in there, of course, and, you know, down wedged in there. And then they would fill it, backfill it with dirt. So then nobody knows what's underneath it. <laughs> Nothing underneath it. Fill it with water? Uh, well, once they stopped 
mining any of these things within 48 to 30, 48 to hours to, to 96 hours, the, the water would have come back up to probably, you know, would fill them halfway up again. Not all the way to the top. Although there are a number of springs around town that just kind of spring up. <laughs> what happened though, as you may have heard, there's a, on a couple of locations, we've had some uh, two different major shafts that have fallen in. One was directly in front of the um, elementary school, and that was maybe close to seven, eight years ago now, I suppose, maybe longer. You know, time goes by and it's fun. But um, they, 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 they fell in because of that very reason. And the, the one in front of the elementary school fell in and the way the county figured is they went and they dug a trench around, or not a trench, but a shelf around it, put steel beams across it, and laid concrete slabs and then filled it back over. So it, it could never, it never happened. They did this in about six weeks time. But another shaft at the bottom end of, of, of one of the streets that uh, fell in, and it actually was on BLM land, it was just off of the county area in the BLM land. Uh, the BLM, uh, it took them three years to figure out how to do the same thing the county did in six weeks. The, uh, and what they did was, instead of doing that process of putting a shelf on it and covering it back over, they just started dumping dirt into it. And they dumped dirt into it, dumped dirt into it, dumped dirt into it, and, and uh, uh, finally they were able to do something. I, I don't even remember what it was, and then finally they got it kind of filled in, but it was right next door to the high school. We do get air shafts that fall in once in a while. But you know, I get a lot of questions from people asking, well, you know, did you ever see that movie, um, um, uh, Paint Your Way? Is it Paint Your Way? Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Uh, you know, where the whole town falls in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doesn't it make you nervous to live here? You know, it, 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 might that happen? No. Uh, because if you think about these mines and these shafts a little bit, you realize that these, these, these shafts, okay, they're 10 by 10 and they go straight down. The, the spider webbing tunnels, or actually, technically, they're called adits because a tunnel has to have light at both ends to be a tunnel. And added only has light at one end or has an opening at one end. Those things were really, when you get down inside there, those things are only about three and a half, four feet wide, the tunnels are, and they're only about five and five and a half feet tall. It's really small and narrow in there. So I kind of equate it to like a, a wormhole in an apple. If you had an apple that has a bunch of wormholes in it, and you squeezed it really hard, would that apple collapse? And no, I've never seen that happen, but I, I don't know. You know. It wouldn't collapse because of the wormhole. Kind of the same concept. Where the problem might, might potentially lie, although I've never seen it happen, is when you, when you get in those adits, in those tunnels, you have, you have what, essentially a cavity. Think of a cavity like a cavity in a tube. The cavity opens up, and, and that's where they've taken out all this ore. How did they backfill that? Well, they did that with what was called the square set timbering. And the square set timbering is just is a, is, is pieces of wood that are 16 inches by 16 inches by 8 feet tall. And it's a, it's a, it's a tongue and, not tongue and glue, but a mortise and tenon process. And these things fit together and they, they, they are blocks. And, and that's what's what holds the dirt back. Well, once that fills with water, if it fills back up and fills with water, then you've got the water pressure holding it back as well. So for that to all collapse, and here again, that starts at least 300 feet underground before you see any of that kind of thing at all. It doesn't come up to the surface. So there's really not much concern about that. The, the old timers around town <coughs> really don't have much concern about that. They don't think about it. Now, there used to be lots of, of air shafts, and these air shafts, uh, or some of them are maybe, they're, they're small, you know, at 10, 15, 20 inches across, and they're usually pipes or tubes that come out of the ground, and that's what the air would go down to get the circulation going to, to get fresh air. Well, as a result, you know, many, many years ago, you know, that's where you dumped your oil when you changed your car oil. <laughs> and, uh, you get in trouble for doing that now, and now uh, they catch you. Um, and, and, uh, uh, but you know, that's where the kids throw sticks down and rocks down to see what you can, and there's still a few of those around, but uh, those, those, things, those, those things are still there. 
Uh, once in a while, something will open up, but or you can do a little sinkage. You just fill it in and continue. There's one guy's driveway that does that every once in a while. <laughs> and uh, so what he did is he just poured concrete over the top of it, and and it fell. It, it sunk again, but the concrete just stayed there. So he didn't do much That's concern. Far. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide, please. And you know what? We're probably you know I can see I can go on. Uh, this is the this is Santiago Mill on Carson River. Slide. <coughs> this is the Eureka Mill on Carson River. Next slide. Ah, and here's some of the guys. This is what I call a uh, uh, a shift photo or a class photo. Uh, now um, these 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 fellows these are fascinating to sit there and take one of these pictures. And this is a, a this is a picture that's about about this big. It's a hard back photograph, and to look at these guys. If you look at these guys, and, and you know, if you're if you're into studying people at all, uh, you, you look at these guys and you go, look at, the, look at the hats that they're wearing, the style of hats, and kind of look where they're placed on their heads. Uh, this guy, uh, this guy must be uh, he must be a heavy duty guy. He's got another tie. He must be one of the bosses. No, um, this one. The what? Nobody's smiling. No, nobody's smiling. That's kind of interesting. Uh, of course, the time at the time these photographs were these kind of photographs were taken, that was pretty much the norm. But you didn't smile at photographs at all. Uh, look at the clothing they wear. This is this is this is the, it's dirty. It's it's uh, disheveled. Now, usually they had much like the coal mines today. Uh, they had they would go come out of the mines on their ship, and they worked like twelve hour shifts. They come out and they had changing rooms, so they they can change into some nicer clothes. But this is obviously their work clothes. Look at their boots; are, they're not very good condition. Um, you, you see that see that candle holder? Every man had his own candle holder uh, for for for. Um, uh, you see them all right here. He had their own candle holder. And see right here is a lunch pail. You got one right here, right over here in this cabinet is a lunch pail. We're having, of course, Virginia City sesquicentennial this year, 1859 2009, 150 years. And no, I wasn't there at the beginning. Um, the, uh, you know, they, we're going to do one thing. We're going to have a, a um, no, i, I got to get this right, pasties um, cooking uh, contest. I, I, you have to be careful because the other option is pasties. And, and, um, the, the uh, uh, we're gonna have this, this we're gonna have a contest and sale for pasties, and that's that's a Cornish meat pie essentially. If you're not familiar with that, and these guys would they, they would make those at home. They, they would put hot water in the pans, and in this top portion would be hot water, and then you would keep that in there. And it would keep their warm food fairly fairly warm, relatively warm. They would usually in down the mines. They would put that near a, uh, maybe a steam fissure that would be coming out of the ground, pretty common, or a hot water leak. And it would keep their food warm. Sometimes they'd wrap it in paper, they put it inside their shirt or in their pants, and that would help keep keep it warm too. Um, my wife makes pasties every once in a while, and we have them for dinner, and they're, they're wonderful. It's sort of like a Cornish burrito, I guess you could say, if you would. Uh, next picture. Yeah, that should be another picture. Look at these guys. These are, these are some hardcore guys. Here's, here's, old, here's old Pat Conway. And, uh, uh, Franklin Buck, I think is who that is, if I remember correctly. This one, Pat Conway, is fascinating. I had this picture hanging up in our store. It's still hanging there, just in front of people. And I had some guy walk in here, I don't know, four or five years ago and go, that's my great grandfather. He goes, no, I said, I said, prove it. He, he had, people walk in the store all the time with all kinds of records and so forth of, that they're looking for other information. Where did my great grandfather live? Where was his store? And this sort of thing. And uh, I have all kinds of, I have, I have city directories. Uh, every city directory that Virginia City ever made all the way back to 1862. Wow. And so I can look up all this stuff. And these things are in pretty sad shape, actually, most of them. They've been so used. So this guy says, well, he lived on such and such a street. We looked it up. There's old Pat Conway. It was his grandfather. And he had this sheaf of papers. And he had a picture that was... Um, He's all dressed up and nice and so forth, but it was obviously the same guy. And, uh, and I had that happen every once in a while. But look at this. This, this picture is a little bit older than the first one. 
And uh, I meant to pick up one of these lanterns and bring it with me. These, uh, uh, these are called uh, 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 Chinette lanterns, or they call it, sometimes they call them Grant lanterns, because there was a famous picture of, of, of President Grant that uh, he took a picture with him holding one of these lanterns, and so they call them Grant lanterns. But it actually was manufactured by uh, a man by the name of Chinette in Virginia City. And uh, uh, those lanterns, if you find an original one now, they're around $2,500. Find an original one. Uh, the funny part of this is, it is uh, quite a few number of years ago in our basement, I found all the, the remaining parts that uh, when Jeanette died in 1906, um, uh, of all the remaining parts that, that he had for making those lanterns. <clears throat> so I could, I could, if, if I wanted to burn the heck out of my fingers doing the uh, the soldering. Uh, I could uh, I could make up probably a hundred of those lanterns, and, and they would look they would be the same as they were made at that point in time. Next slide, please. Question. Yes, question. <clears throat> when men used to do individual plaster mining, the dream was always to get rich, strike it rich. Yes. These guys were mostly union employees, probably, or just grunts. But still, the wages must have been enough to keep them doing that rather than a safer job somewhere else. You're, you're absolutely right. It's, 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 it's a, a very correct observation. Uh, first off, the, 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 the mining industry or the mining unions were essentially founded in Virginia City. That's where mining unions began. And yes, they were represented by unions. There was a miners union hall in Virginia City. There was a miners union hall in Gold Hill. And they were very close-knit situations. These guys were the highest paid miners in the mining industry in the entire world at that time. They received four dollars a day. The average pay was two two dollars to two and a quarter a day. Uh, a lumber a lumber mill worker uh, up at Lake Tahoe in that same period of time would get paid uh, by the number of uh, cord of wood that they could cut, that they could cut up. And uh, they would get paid uh, 25 cents per cord of wood they cut. How many cord of wood can you cut by yourself in one day? <laughs> These guys worked 12 hour shifts. They lived in an environment where they, um, they might have lived in a boarding house, they might have had their family home, but if they lived in a boarding house, it's a good likelihood that the boarding house that they lived in was, um, was what they call a 12 on 12 off boarding house. And what they would do is they would only rent that room in that boarding house for 12 hours. Now if you work the graveyard shift, then you got the room from, 12, from let's say 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then your, your, uh, uh, your, your room went to the guy who rented it from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Because you were, you were at work or and when he was sleeping, and he was sleeping, and when he was at work, you were sleeping. So you only rented that room for half of that 24 hour period of time. That was pretty common. Now, Twain, and Twain made a comment about when he was there, Mark Twain. And uh, he said, he, he said in, in his book, Roughing It, he said, uh, the walls were so thin that, because uh, they were made out of muslin, he said the, the, the wall, and oftentimes canvas are just muslins that separated this. So the walls were so thin you could hear the ladies changing their minds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next slide. This is taken down, and this is one of the very few that you'll ever run across that uh, is, a, is a picture of down inside the mines. Now I have a whole bunch of pictures showing down inside the mines, but of the equipment that's there, not, not very many of them with the men doing something. This is a this, this ore cart is wood. Uh, the later ones were all metal, but these are wood sides and uh, with metal corners on them and, and metal slats to hold them. But uh, there's, there's, I've only ever seen one other wooden, uh, wooden, wooden ore cart outside the area and actually have it in, in our building. Uh, you just don't see them. But these, these guys, uh, this is, remember the camera was invented in 1831. And, and uh, so by 1860s, 1870s, Camera process is pretty well along. They're, they're, it, it's still pretty, um, pretty uh, 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 basic 
to, to take a photograph. I mean, it's hard work because they had to take a, a piece of glass, they had to put it into a chemical, and then they had to keep that piece of glass with the chemical on it wet until they could get it to their camera. And then they would take that picture, and then they had to get that back without any light hitting it. They'd get it back to, to their dark room, wherever it was. Sometimes it was in a wagon. Sometimes it was in the structure, uh, and then and you could uh, uh, and then take your picture. You know, I, I I don't even know what number slide we're on at the thing, but I know we're you know. Um, uh, so here you asked a question about the miners' union. Here's the miners' union hall, and uh, uh, in Virginia City, it has since been restored. This picture was probably taken in the 1930s, and um, it has since been restored. <coughs> And, and uh, they had the Miners Union Hall, originally 1800s, had a, a library. A library to, that, that uh, was that had all the latest books, everything from Shakespeare to uh, 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 Deadwood, Deadwood Dick's Mining, or uh, uh, Western Adventures magazines, and what have you. And every once in a while, you, you, can go, you might go to a garage sale, or you'll go to an antique shop, and you'll find an old book, and you'll open it up, and it'll say, uh, Virginia City Miners Union Hall. And uh, you'll find them every once in a while. They're out there. Next slide. Uh, Piper's Opera House. How do they entertain themselves? Piper's Opera House. They, with the opera, with, the, with a, a myriad of different things, how they entertain themselves. Uh, Piper's Opera House was, was one of, this is one of the earliest Piper, this is the, this is the second Piper's Opera House. Um, this one burned in 1875, uh, and then the third one is the one that, uh, uh, actually, well, let me back this up. Technically speaking, this would be the um, uh, third Piper's Opera House, because the first one was, he bought, a, he bought an opera house from John McGuire, <coughs> and then he turned it into Piper's. Then he goes up and he puts the Piper's Opera House up here. It, it burns in 1875. It gets rebuilt, and this is what he rebuilt. This one burns again in 1885, and what's there now is, is what was rebuilt after 1885. He, uh, the the uh, John Piper burned his third one, his, his other one down, accidentally after the performance when he left a cigar burning in his, in his apartment, so he burned it down himself. Um, next slide. Okay, that's inside Piper's Opera House. Here's an interesting thing about the cultural aspect. And uh, this not, these guys weren't in Piper's Opera House. But uh, can you put, I don't know if you have. Yeah, can you, can you go away from that? I just wanted to point something out. Uh, this, this fellow down here, this is one of the few pictures you'll see of, of, of uh, African American in uh, on the Comstock any place. Um, uh, obviously a worker. Stagehand at Piper's Opera House. Next slide. We had, we had a band. They had, their own, they had various sizes. This is four members of, of a band. And you got a trumpet, uh, looks like a couple of violins, and a bass. Uh, must have been some wonderful music. Probably early rappers. You know? uh, but uh, next slide. Baseball, big thing. At baseball in Virginia City. Uh, this is a Comstock right here. Virginia, BC, Virginia City. This is uh, actually this photograph is about 1890. Um, after and they were members of a town team, and they would play in Reno, Carson, uh, Gardnerville, or uh, Carson Valley area here. Uh, they travel all around. You know, next slide. Here's your, here's your ice cream social. This is in the Armory Hall. Uh, this was a National Guard hall. There were the National Guard had three different units there. You had the Washington Guard, the Emmett Guard, and the third one escaped me, uh, guard. But anyway, there were three National Guard units. And uh, this was an ad, this was very common in the National Guard building. The National Guard building fell down in the 1940s due to snow load. <coughs> Here's the Washington the Emmett Guard parading on B Street. Now, if you've ever been to Virginia City for a parade, all the parades go from south to north on C Street. This, this, in this period of time, 1870s, 1880s, this is B Street. And they come from north to south on B Street. Because B Street was one of the primary uh, commercial areas. It wasn't uh, C Street so much. It was B Street that was the primary commercial. This, this uh, structure right in here uh, is the back side of what is now the, what you see is the Washington Club on the other, on the C Street side. International Hotel. And um, uh, 
just up from here was a stock exchange. And uh, there was also a small stock exchange uh, telegraph located in this building, but on the front side, on the C Street side. This is company B, Immigrant, Immigrant Guard. Next slide. Uh, this is the flu. This is the flu ride. Now, this is a this is a really fun picture, and there's documentation where these idiots <laughs> would get up there and ride this, the, this. I mean, this was the first roller coaster, I guess. <laughs> this is on the Grid. and and to, to to show you that our politicians, uh, not that we mean to, to demean any particular politician, are not any smarter today than they were then. <laughs> This is Governor Reinhold Sadler, as you can see. <laughs> nothing to hold on to. Whether you're thinking, uh, I wonder if I'll live through this. <laughs> and uh, you see, the only thing holding him back here is a piece of wood. So when that piece of, when this guy lifts that piece of wood up, it's hell bent for leather to Carson City. <laughs> look at this, look at this lady back here with her parasol. <laughs> Soil her pants in the back. <laughs> back here too, look at these parasols back here, and these ladies back here, and they're the only thing, only thought that came to my mind, I'm thinking, um, you know, I wonder if they really actually went ahead and did this or if this was just staged. Uh, uh, but uh, this almost looks like this guy here, I wondered, I, I, there's no way to be able to really tell or but this guy, to me, looks like he could be actually one of two people. Uh, but I think that he's, I think there's a possibility this could be John Mack uh, doing some looking at various things. Look at the condition of the clothing this guy's got a long coat, he's got his, you know, he's got a nice shoe on there, he's got nice pants, on, a waistcoat, a shirt, top hat. This guy is obviously the ringmaster. And he's standing, he's probably standing there going to he had to wear the long coat because he probably got the pockets filled up with quarters and these doofus is paid to go do this, right? Now, how many, by a raise of hand, would go do this? <laughs> with nothing to hold on to? Well, I just want to be in the center because it looks like he's got all these posts and it starts to bend and he's reached out to him and moves over. So. Probably so, yeah, good bet, yeah. And if you did want to do this, I, I, I'd, talk to, I'd probably talk to your wife first and say, what kind of shirts you got? Next slide. Uh, <coughs> here we are, kind of get into these businesses. I'll try to move faster. I hope I'm not boring anybody. Um, Great. I'm Joe Rubato. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, I figured we're probably more. Okay, we'll flip through a couple here. This is just to show you here that the kinds of businesses. You've got lumber mills, uh, you've got a, uh, the Virginia, Virginia Public School is another school here. All these businesses, look at this little thing here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, looking up, up C, or south on C Street, uh, this is where those, uh, in the Skilligan Mott Company, is where those lanterns were made. This building right here is where the Mark Twain Bookstore is. That's our building right there. It was built in 1862. Uh, this is this structure here uh, is is where the uh, Territorial Enterprise Museum and so forth is currently housed. Right there, next slide. Fourth Ward School. We've all seen that. They were built for 1,200 students. First Ward School on the north end of town. Next slide. Uh, this is a livery stable that's, uh, act, that was actually in the building that we own, that we have with a book, the bookstore book right over here on this side. And over here is what's now the country cover. And I filled this in with a set of nice double doors. And that uh, used to be a big sliding door. Down in the basement is, uh, uh, the, is the uh, stalls for the horses and so forth. Next slide. Uh, this was a, uh, a um, uh, mortician. Uh, this was Kitsmart King. Uh, and Kitzmeyer didn't have a drugstore, and then Kitzmeyer later moved to Carson City and had Kitzmeyer Drugstore in Carson City. Uh, if any of you are familiar with that, next slide. Uh, this is um, uh, the, the uh, meat market. This was uh, Ziegler's uh, kosher, kosher Meat Market. Next slide. You know, those buildings were still perfect back then. 
Yeah, that's right, they were. <laughs> you think that happened just recently? Uh, this, this is the, what is today is the Warshaw Club. It is exactly the same doors. They're still on the Warshaw Club, still there. Uh, this is what's in what's called the Douglas Building. Uh, this is Worth Timers, cigars, tobacco. Um, this is not a real person. And this is in here. <laughs> and you can tell by the wheel. Um, Wells Fargo. Did you know Wells Fargo started in Virginia City? Mm -hmm. Started. Started in Virginia City. Wells Fargo first bank is in Virginia City, right here. Our building is right down here. And uh, this is a few buildings up the Wells Fargo stage getting ready to leave. Next slide. Wells Fargo, right there. Go down in the 30s, or 40s, excuse me. Next slide. Uh, Vogel's Books, Stationery. <coughs> And uh, up the street from where we are now, next slide. Hatch Brothers Groceries and Provisions, they were a big, they, they were the Smiths of their time. They had like three stores in town, Hatch Brothers did. Next. Uh, Convoy's Coffin Warehouse. They were also furniture manufacturers, coffin people and undertakers. Uh, you see undertakers right there were uh, also manufacturing furniture. Next. Uh, this is uh, Lanyo's Virginia City uh, Coffee and Spice Company. Uh, uh, Abel Lanyo <coughs> and his, and his uh, stepbrother uh, August Bohamin. Uh, Abel Lanyo um, was uh, killed in a robbery. He's buried in Virginia City. And uh, Bohamin later then sold the business and went back to France where they came from. Uh, the, uh, their relatives walked into the store one day and uh, brought this picture to me from France. I didn't speak English. I didn't speak French. Just fun. Next. This is, uh, Chris, anybody of you uh, from years back go to the Crystal Saloon? Crystal Bar? Yeah, many years ago. This is when the Crystal Bar was in where the Washer Club is now. This was uh, prior to Washer, the, the Crystal moved to, the, to the, its current, or what was its current location, now the Visitor Center in 1936. But this is the Washer Club. Uh, when it was uh, at that point in time. The, with this washing club now, in the crystal. Next slide. And the California Brewery, this is another brewery. This is uh, right now the middle school gymnasium is located here. And uh, right behind it is the Fireman's Museum on C Street. This is on, this is D Street. Uh, uh, next slide, barely show that. Um, International Hotel, stage company, next, uh, next slide. Uh, this is another view of the International Hotel. Next. Uh, this is the backside of the International Hotel. This is the backside. This is the B Street. This is the corner <coughs> of the Piper's Opera House. Next slide. This is the uh, International Hotel, the morning after October 1914, when it burned. Uh, next slide. This is the uh, Frederick House on B Street, the International Hotel, and Frederick House. You can see this was a four-story, five-story facility on the back side itself. A couple of cobblers in here, and uh, uh, a bucket of blood uh, over on the, well, this is a, obviously a stereo part, but the bucket of blood building where it's on this side of the This is Union Street. Next slide. Sutro. We won't get into Sutro. We can maybe do that at another time and talk about it. Maybe it come back another time and talk about some other things. But I think that we've really kind of gone on a long way here, and I really appreciate your um, um, your participation and your attention. Uh, you've been a, a great, great bunch, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to kind of provide some of this information to you. And uh, I'll entertain a few quick questions if, if you so desire, or afterwards, or whatever.